<clears throat> okay, so last week we, we, we started on the faith, it's called the Faith Hall of Fame, right? Hebrews 11, the whole chapter, is just an itemized list of the elders who walked by faith. Now, the exhortation to these Jewish believers, if you recall back in, in, at the conclusion of chapter 10, the exhortation to these Hebrew believers was, the just shall live by faith, right? And so the, the author of Hebrews is exhorting them to continue in faith. And he's going to, to strengthen that position by Hebrews chapter 11, giving example after example after example of the elders who walked by faith. And I wanted to read this, um, I didn't write this passage down, but at the end of Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 10, Titus, Hebrews chapter 10. Um, he writes, he says, uh, <clears throat> verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or destruction, but them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now the, the exhortation all along has been to these Hebrew believers that if they were to draw back from their faith and go back to temple sacrifices and worship, that they would suffer perdition or the destruction that would come upon unbelieving Israel in A.D. 70. Of course, uh, the author at that time did not know when this destruction would come, but we now know historically that it came in A.D. 70 under the leadership of General Titus of Rome. Jerusalem was destroyed. The people uh, uh, were, were slaughtered, and the surviving Jews were cast to the four corners of the earth. Right? And... <laughs> And I mean, if you want to see if the Word of God, if this is really the Word of God, just look at Israel. Israel was dispersed just as Jesus Christ said they would be. And guess what? Just as Ezekiel said, they have been regathered in unbelief. They're back in the land. This is a miracle. Of course, we, we all have been born after Israel came back to the land. So it's like, yeah, so what? Israel's in the land. No, that's a big thing, right? And that's, a, that's a, the evidence that this book is supernatural. Because there is no other people group that has been dispersed around the world like that, like the Jewish people, that did not ultimately assimilate into the culture and, and the bloodline of the people that they were dispersed to. But the Jewish people have been preserved and have been regathered into the land of Israel for a final time of judgment and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. You want to talk about a reason to believe this book is from God, look at the nation and history of Israel. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Uh, we looked at the Six-Day War. We, we talked about that. I, this is really a big tangent here, so we're not going to make it far today. Um, when Israel fought the War of Independence in 1948, does anyone remember how, how large their, their military and their air force was? Anyone remember uh, the War of Independence? They had six airplanes. They had smuggled six German Messerschmitts, World War II Messerschmitts, in pieces out of Europe and reassembled them in Israel. And they had a, a mighty force of six aircraft. And what happened? They fought the War of Independence, and not only were they victorious against all the Muslim countries around them, but they expanded and held onto their territory when the armistice was signed. Then you go to the Six-Day War, which I think that's what I mentioned, but the Six-Day War, they fought and destroyed the Syrian army, the Egyptian army, and the Jordanian army in six days and reconquered Jerusalem. You want to talk about miracles? Look at the nation of Israel. And, and it, it is the beautiful uh, exhibit A, if you want to know if this book is the word of God, okay? Uh, because Israel is falling right into line with exactly what God said would happen in the last days. So, <clears throat> so these Jews were, were being tempted back into the text here. They're being tempted to go back to temple worship to abandon their faith in Jesus Christ, to set it aside or at least pretend that they didn't believe so that they wouldn't see, receive persecution. Well, the author has been telling them, if you do this, then you are going to, not only uh, is it going to be worse, but you're going to lose your lives in the destruction of Jerusalem as a severe discipline uh, for drawing back away from their faith that Jesus was and is the Messiah. Now, we know historically that they did. They heeded, the, they heeded the exhortation, the warnings of Hebrews, and God preserved them as they fled when the, when the, uh, the city was besieged. The first uh, siege of the city was pulled back, and then they were able to flee 
and then the siege came back again, and then the Jerusalem was destroyed. And the Jewish believers that were being written to here, they walked by faith, and they fled, and they were not killed. And so here we see, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or destruction, but them that believe to the saving of the soul. And so now being exhorted to walk by faith, he's going to give all these examples. Again, Hebrews 11 is called the Faith Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame for a reason. And so we get into the text and we see a little bit about the nature of faith. In verse 1, Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Again, by way of review here, so we'll go over this somewhat quickly. <laughs> now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, for by faith, the elders obtained a good report or a good testimony, a good witness. Do you want to have a good witness before God? Believe his word. Walk by faith, okay? And you will have a good testimony. And you know what? Don't worry about anything else. We're going to talk, you know, as we read through here, we're going to see all the, the things that these people did by faith. Don't worry about the things that you're supposed to do. Believe God's word and you'll do a lot. God will take care of what he wants you to do in life. He'll take you in paths you never anticipated ever. And you will bear fruit and bear testimony to the faith that you have. What our responsibility is as believers, you see that word believers, is to believe the word of God. And guess what? It is that faith that God counts as righteousness, not our good deeds. It is the faith that he gives us that he counts as righteousness. And that faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be very specific. It is that epiphany moment when you believe the truth that Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And that he was buried and he, yes, he literally rose from the dead on the third day. And that epiphany moment, that moment you believe that truth, God counts you as righteous. He reckons your faith as righteous and seals you in Jesus Christ. And guess what? You will never, ever, never, ever, ever, never perish but have everlasting life. You have the gift of eternal life. That's how important faith is. And this is why this chapter is very important for our lives of faith too, not just the Jewish believers that are receiving this message. So we see what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's the first thing. Faith has substance. There is a concrete reality to our faith. It is not just, oh, I just believe. I just, whatever I want to believe, I just stir it up in my head and I just believe it. Now, that's a faith of the world, uh, you know, or the superstitious faith of religion. Oh, you believe this, I believe that, they contradict each other, no big whoop, as long as you believe, you've got something to believe. No, it matters what you believe. Is it the truth or is it not true? Is there substance to it or is it, is it the vanity, the imaginations of man's heart? What is it that you're believing? You must believe the truth of the word of God to have eternal life. Okay, but there's a substance to the things hoped for. When we sing these hymns, Amazing Grace, there is a substance to that grace. This is real substantive grace. Can't you see the beauty of the world, God's creation? It's made perfectly for us. We're going to look at the creation. The creation cries out of a loving, uh, eternal God who made all things. Okay, all you got to do is look up and look around and say, Man, <laughs> this didn't freakishly just happen out of happenstance. There's order and design and purpose in everything. How about that? I've got lungs <gasps> that draw in oxygen that God put in the air, and I, I, I need that to live. Boy, good, I'm glad that worked out through, you know, evolution and the Big Bang Theory. It's nonsensical. Obviously, there is a God. Faith, there's substance to the things that we believe, the substance, the concrete reality. And once you know there's a concrete reality... You have assurance. I'm confident. There's a confidence in your faith. You ever talk to a religious person? They're always ambiguous and not confident. Well, I hope when I die. Well, I'm thinking, you know, I might, you know. What happens to you when you die? Well, I hope I go blah, 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 you know. And then they just regurgitate what they've been taught. Instead of a concrete, substantive reality, folks, when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? By faith. There's substance to it. There's substance. And Jesus Christ is the substance of, of all that God is blessing us with. The substance, the concrete reality, the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, faith has evidence. 
It's not blind faith. It is not a leap in the dark. That is not biblical faith. Biblical faith is founded upon substantive reality that you cannot determine with your eyes. It's a reality that cannot be measured with the five senses. It is a reality that is only made known through revelation of the word of God to our heart. That epiphany moment when God lifts the veil and shows you Jesus Christ. And you believe. That's what you, you, you believe. I was 16 at my dinner table, right, Stephen? Yeah. I was at my dinner table. When that old preacher man came in and told me that I was a sinner and that Jesus Christ died on the cross for this sinner, he was buried and he was raised the third day. I believed it. I believed it. You know the story. It's like, oh. <laughs> he asked me, you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'm like, that's kind of scary. Looked at mom, looked at dad, you know the routine. Looked back at him. I was overwhelmed with the reality of what I had just been shown spiritually in my inner man. I knew it was true. I said, yes, I do. Well, I was saved at that moment. I believed. I had eternal life right then. But I said the prayer, and, I, and he went on his way. and never met the man again. But he'll be rewarded for his faithfulness sharing with me. Here I am teaching in my living room now. I'm 57 years old. I was 16, dumb punk at 16. Here I am. And I'm not here for the money. <laughs> right? <laughs> or the fame, yeah. So uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's why I say look at Israel. Look at the Old Testament. The judgments on the nation of Israel, how God would disperse them. Jesus himself said that, that they would be dispersed, and how they'd be regathered. Folks, there's no way that the will of man can carry this out over nearly 2,000 years of exile, the Jewish people in exile. So when you look at that and you say, man, how can that happen? How can these Jews continue to exist? The whole world hates the Jew, right? I mean, isn't anti-Semitism the, the greatest hatred in the world? Anti-Semitism, we hate the Jews. Why? Why is there, do you ask, why is there this passionate hatred of this poor little Jewish people that they have a, a piece of land no larger than the state of New Jersey, and yet everybody wants that land. I want that land. It's my land. We're taking that land. And you Jews have to get off of it. Why? What's the big fuss? Because there is a spiritual force that despises the Jews because they are the source of salvation in this world. Because a Jewish carpenter named Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, came through the Jewish line and brings salvation to Jew and Gentile. And when the Jews cry out for him to return, that's when he comes back and he's going to put a whooping on Satan, big time. Cast him in the abyss. Satan don't like that, so he wants to kill the Jews so they can't cry out for him to return. Okay, so all these things are, are falling into place. This is evidence of things not seen. The, the hand of God is manifested in these evidences. You see, again, faith is not just a leap in the dark. Ah, you pick that, I pick this, whatever. We both believe something. Well, if you don't believe the truth, you'll perish in your sins. See, you have to have the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse your sins. You have to believe upon him to receive eternal life. And you believe anything else, you'll die in your sins. Your sins will not be purged. They will abide upon you. You'll die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you go into the lake of fire. No one need to die in their sins. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, delivered from that wrath. But this is, this is we receive this. It is appropriated to us as we believe. Now notice this. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We talked about this last week. <clears throat> I can't reach in my pocket and pull out justification. Here you go. Here's my justification. I'm going to touch that, smell it, you know, feel it, what it feels like. No, it's it's a concrete. It, it, it's not a concrete, tangible reality that we can see with our senses. It is something that God decrees uh, with the moment that we believe. You've been declared righteous by God. Well, you receive that by faith. You don't perceive that with the senses. Eternal life is a substance. God has given us eternal life, but you receive it by faith, right? It's, it's not, it's not uh, something that we can see and taste or touch physically. The resurrection from the dead, see, is, is the same thing. It's our, the blessed hope when Jesus Christ returns and, and we receive a glorified body. We, we can't, we, we receive that by faith. It hasn't happened yet, but it's a concrete reality in the future that will occur. And so faith is foundational to the Christian life. Um, 
For by, it, by faith the elders obtained a good report or a testimony. And we'll see this word repeated as we go through the, down these examples of, uh, of, uh, of, of those who walked by faith <clears throat> and received a testimony of the Lord. We'll, the next one will be Abel, who received a testimony that he was righteous. Right? There's the testimony of God that he was a righteous man uh, by faith. So then um, we talked about Romans 10, 17, how you get faith. Well, the, the Bible says, so then faith, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you've got a chain from heaven to earth how faith is, is brought to the average human being. It begins with God. Now, by the way, Whenever you have exercised faith or you refuse to believe and you, you exercise unbelief, ultimately what you're doing is making a statement about the character of God. It is ultimately, faith is ultimately, when, it, when you boil down faith, you're boiling down to whether or not you know God. And, and so faith is ultimately attached to God. God is the author of our faith, and it begins with his word. So we see that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you reverse engineer this, God speaks. That is the beginning of the faith process, when God speaks forth his word. Now, his word has been preserved in this book, the Bible. Not any other book, just this book. Uh, this book is what? Six, it's not one book, it's 66 books written over how long, son? 15. 1,500 years, to 16. right? Mm -hmm. How many authors? 40. 40 authors, awesome. Over a period of 15, 1,600 years. Now think about this. These people over 15, 1,600 years, they don't even know each other. Most of them don't know each other. And they're writing their little piece and putting it in the book. And there's a harmony to this book that is, that is from beginning to end a harmony. And I, I compare it to a mosaic. The Bible is a mosaic or a puzzle. A 66-piece puzzle made by 40 different men who didn't know each other. They carved out their own piece and put it in the box. And when you put the whole thing together, it's a picture of Jesus Christ. That is a supernatural revelation. And that's what the Bible is. Not by any books of men, but by the Bible. This masterpiece, the sovereign... Uh, Preservation, creation of God, and the preservation of his word. It's right here. You say, ah, no, it isn't. There you go. That's unbelief. That's unbelief. See? Say, I don't believe Jesus. Ah, oh, Jesus died for my sins. I don't believe that exactly. That's unbelief. And you'll die in your sins. Um, <clears throat> there's two ways that, that, uh, that you can have your sins forgiven, or, or not really have your sins forgiven. There are two ways to receive eternal life. Number one is to be uh, perfect, to keep the law of Moses perfectly all your life. How's, how's that going for anyone? Not too well. <laughs> okay, the other way is to receive Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and was buried and raised from the dead to receive him by faith and God gives you the gift of righteousness freely through belief, through trusting his word. But this book is the word of God. You want to know what God says? You want to have faith? Open the book and read it. This is God's word. This is it. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So God speaks, and, 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 and the truth about God is he is faithful and powerful. He is faithful to his word, and he's powerful to fulfill it. And so, again, we're, we're making a statement. Of, when we believe the word of God, we are making actually a statement about God and his character. When you say, no, I don't believe that, you're making an indictment against God that he is a liar. You're calling God a liar when you do not believe his word. You say, that's not true. This is not the, this isn't the word of God. We're calling God a liar because he says it is the word of God. It's his word. And it's all true. No, it isn't. It's a book of men. You're making an indictment on the character of God. He's not faithful. He's not trustworthy. He is a liar. And that is the work of Satan to project himself upon God and to make himself to have the character of God, which is to steal his glory. But anyway, the... So God has the word spoken, and then the, comes the hearing part. And that's the word perceived. So when I was 16 years old, sitting at my dinner table, uh, that preacher came and he shared the gospel with me. He shared the word of God. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, how Christ died on the cross for my sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised again from the dead according to the scriptures. And so he brought that word to me. And I'd heard that story before. I'd been in church before many, many times. I'd heard that message. But at that moment, God spoke to me and lifted the veil of my understanding. And I perceived the reality of the truth of Jesus Christ by faith at that moment. It wasn't like any other times like, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Are we done yet? Can I go? I don't, okay, yeah. Easter, Christmas, blah, blah, blah. No, this was the epiphany moment where God said, it's time for Ron to receive eternal life. And he lifted the veil and I perceived this truth that it was for me, my sins. And I believed it. I didn't ask to believe. I didn't even want to be at that meeting at our dinner table. I just did it so I wouldn't be grounded anymore. My mom grounded me for being naughty. So... <clears throat> I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll put up with this guy so I'm not grounded anymore. And God said, surprise, ta-da, there's Jesus Christ and you have eternal life. You didn't bank on that, did you, Ron? And so, so I heard the word of God and it produced faith inside of me. I believed it. It was this new epiphany revelation. I never understood it till that moment and that is what faith is. Faith is the word embraced. You receive the word into your heart. You say, amen. Amen is true. You don't act like it's true, like, okay, I'm supposed to say amen, and then, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> you, you perceive it like the, the veil is lifted and you perceive this great spiritual truth as God has now spoken personally, or a a word to you. That's a faith, a faith is the moment the word of God is embraced. And a miracle is when the word of God is fulfilled. A miracle is when the word of God is fulfilled. So like, uh, <clears throat> You know, if, if, if I were to die of a heart attack and be buried, there's going to be a day when the word of God is going to raise me up from the dead. My body will come forth out of the grave in a glorified state like Jesus Christ. And it will, my body will shoot up into the air with the Lord Jesus in the rapture of the church. There is a resurrection for the wicked. And there's a resurrection for the righteous. The resurrection for the, for the righteous is to spend eternity with God in the new heavens and new earth. The resur resurrection of the wicked is to stand before God in judgment. They will be uh, judged for their sins, the rejection of Jesus Christ, and cast in the lake of fire. They'll have a body that is suited for the lake of fire, a place of eternal torment. Okay, these are substantive, real things. The miracle, the power of God to raise the dead. He demonstrated it when he raised Jesus Christ or when Christ raised himself from the dead. I was thinking, I'm always trying to, to, to frame faith in, so that we can understand it. And faith is essentially knowledge acquired by hearing from God. It's knowledge that is acquired by hearing from God. Unbelief is knowledge acquired by sight or empirical evidence. Okay, so... Like we talked about last week, we've done the studies, Ron. 100 out of 100 people who died are still in the graves. There is no resurrection. Therefore, Jesus did not raise from the dead. The empirical evidence is obvious. It doesn't happen. Well, <clears throat> that's the problem. You're evaluating the Word of God based on empirical evidence. You need to evaluate the evidence in light of the Word of God, the revelation of God. So knowledge that is acquired by hearing from God is faith. <clears throat> God is true. Faith says God is true. Unbelief says no, God is a liar. Um, you know, the nations are going to rage against Israel. Uh, <laughs> they've tried to destroy that little tiny nation state. And, and it, you know, we've talked about this before. Israel's in for, for great tribulation. They are going to suffer tremendously in the tribulation period. But uh, Jesus Christ is going to preserve Israel. They will never be destroyed. In fact, they will enter in and, and be the, the centerpiece of his kingdom. He will reign and rule from Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, the Jew, the God-man who is Jewish, will reign and rule from Jerusalem. And, and the, uh, the Jewish people will become the head of the peoples of the earth at that time. Okay? And, uh, but, but if you look at, you know, say, oh, militarily, you know, they could be wiped off the map so easily by a mighty power like Russia. Oh, really? Russia is going to be destroyed trying to invade Israel, right? In the north, they're going to come down from the north, and God's going to destroy them supernaturally. That hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. 
Um, <clears throat> but the point here is that unbelief is fundamentally rejecting the Word of God, saying no to it. And usually it is, it is based upon uh, empirical evidence or the things that you can observe with your senses. Um, we looked at Abraham. Uh, Abraham was not weak in faith. And what did that mean to be weak in faith? It means assessing the Word of God by our circumstance, circumstances or by sight. <clears throat> um, to be weak in faith, many Christians are weak in faith because they take the Word of God and they blend it with their circumstances. And then they, then they try and, <laughs> they try and uh, jockey and, and, and maneuver the Word of God and, and, and evaluate it in light of circumstances. And where does that lead if we continue that? It leads to a point of unbelief. You'll reject the Word of God and you'll stagger, you'll step back, you'll draw away from the promises of God. Because you'll walk by your, your sight, walk by sight, by your fleshly impulses. Um, John chapter 1 verse 45 through 50 talks about um, the, about Nathaniel's conversion and I love to use this passage because it so clearly boils down the essence of faith and we pick up the text in verse 45 John chapter 1 verse 45 through 50 <clears throat> Philip is, uh, is, has found uh, has been uh, brought to the Messiah he believes that Jesus is the Messiah, so he goes out and finds Nathanael. He says to Nathanael, We have found him of whom the Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, a true Israelite, in whom there is no guile or no deceit. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. So here comes Nathaniel. He's skeptical, but he, he's, you know, he's humoring his friend Philip. And, uh, and so they're going, and he says, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Are you telling me that the prophets, the, the, who, the, the Messiah that they wrote about, and Moses and the law that he wrote about, this guy is from Nazareth? Jesus, okay, I'll go. And as he draws near, Jesus says, There is an Israelite indeed. Behold, a true Israelite in whom is no guile. Whoa, how do you know me? Nathaniel says. He says, Because before Philip came, I saw you under the fig tree. He revealed something of his nature to Nathaniel. He's omniscient. He, this rabbi knew what Nathaniel was doing and wasn't even there. In fact, he knew what he was thinking about. He knew what he was meditating on. I won't get into that. But simply by that revelation, that evidence, you see, Jesus is, is the God-man. If you were to see him on the street, you wouldn't think anything of him. You would pass by him on the street. He, he was a man. He's the perfect God, perfect man. If you saw him, you'd say, just looks like a normal guy. I don't know. There's nothing that says, oh, son of God, by looking at him. Right? It's by faith. And so the evidence was given when Jesus spoke to Nathanael and said, Hey, before Philip, uh, I know you, uh, before Philip even came to see you, you were uh, meditating under that fig tree. <laughs> I'm the Messiah. Of course, he didn't say that. But, but Nathanael understands and he believes. And his confession t shows his faith. That rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And that tells us that by the statements that were made, that Nathaniel understood and believed what the prophets and Moses had written. He had already received the word of God, and so it was hand in glove this moment that the Messiah should be presented to Nathaniel, and he should believe upon him. It's, it was a given because he already believed the prophets in anticipation of the Messiah. He just didn't know who it was until Philip said, there he is right there. And Nathaniel believed. So notice this, Jesus says that is faith. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said unto you, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? 
See, belief and faith are synonyms. It's the same thing. You believe, you perceive, you're persuaded of the truth, the substance of things, hope for, the evidence of things not seen. Nathaniel believed upon the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, that faith of Nathaniel was counted by, for, by God as righteousness. That's why this is so vitally important that we understand this. Because religion says, no, you've got to clean up your life and do this and do good, and hopefully, 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 at the end of your life, you've done enough good that God will reward you with entrance into his kingdom and eternal life. That's a lie. Because all of our righteousnesses, the Bible says, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before God. As I like to say, if you could narrow it down to your top five best things you ever did for another person, top five acts of kindness, God says all of it is tainted with your sin and selfishness and it's a filthy rag. I'll have none of it. He would reject it. But religion says, no, no, no. He accepts this stuff. No, God will accept only the faith of the Son of God. When you believe upon the Son of God, He will count that faith as righteousness, not your behavior. Our faith today, what is it grounded in? It's grounded in the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ was buried. Christ arose from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. If you believe that message, that Christ died for your sins, he was buried and raised from the dead, God will give you eternal life. It's a free gift the moment you believe. It's an epiphany, revelation of, of the work of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, we believe the promise of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Eternal life <clears throat> is received by faith in the Son of God, which we saw in Nathaniel. So he exercised faith. Our hope is that we will obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and biblical hope is the assurance, the, the, the certainty, the certain expectation and assurance of things that have been promised. So we will obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in him. Living by faith, we talked about last week, uh, Galatians 5, 16 and verse 22. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the fruit of the spirit is love. So the characteristic marks of the believer is his confession is love, demonstrating love in a concrete, tangible expression. And so, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, it means it's a synonym for walking by faith. And we walk by faith as we feed our mind on the Word of God. Remember, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, as we expose our inner man to the Word of God by reading it, putting the Word inside of us, thinking about it, meditating upon it, Slowly, that process transforms our thinking and ultimately works its way out to our fingertips. We start to manifest that faith quite naturally, quite spontaneously, without effort, as we abide in Jesus Christ by faith. And as we walk in faith, we are walking in the Spirit. And in that process of faith, God does something on the side we don't even recognize. He's doing a work in us. He's producing the love of God in himself. He's building up Christ in us. And then we become more and more a fragrance of Christ in this world. And it will manifest itself in various assorted good works that God has for us. <clears throat> now, we're not saved by our good works. We're saved by our faith. And again, the temptation is that we turn this into a law and say, okay, well, here's what, uh, you know, here's what Abraham did. Here's what Moses did. Okay, so I got to go out and start doing stuff too. No, just rest in faith. God will do the transforming work as we abide simply in faith. <clears throat> okay? Now, verse 3. We've got uh, 9 minutes, 15 seconds. So let's look at now Hebrews 11.3. Exhibit number 1, the first example of faith. Hebrews 11.3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things that are seen were not made of things which do appear. So the first exhibit of faith is a general statement of faith. By faith, we understand what? That the worlds, this word in the Greek is eons, the ages. So it's, 
It's, it's the whole kit and caboodle, man. It's, it's the creation and, and the timeline of, of creation that it was framed or perfectly completed by the word of God. So that the things that are seen, so I've got my new telescope out here, and I can't wait for the weather to clear up and get a little warm. I'm going to go out there and really zoom in on these stars and stuff. When I look at those stars, I know something about them. I know that they were created by God. The things that are seen, which I can see with my telescope and my naked eye, they were not made out of things that do appear. What does the world tell us about the things that we see? How did this all come to be? What's the world's answer? They say, oh, no, 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 God didn't create. No, 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 no. What's the two things that they say that brought us to an existence? Big Bang. Big Bang. Big bang. Oh, the Big Bang. Stardust. Stardust, <laughs> right. We're nothing but stardust uh, and evolution, right? Yeah. So you've got just, Big Bang and evolution. We landed in some water and then just started growing. The primordial ooze, <laughs> the lightning strike, and boo. This creature was clean. The water. And they climbed out, however he did that, and boom, and became this other creature. And then they had babies. I don't how did that work? Oh, we don't don't ask the details, Ron, how that worked, you know. How did how did half the chromosomes uh, uh, come in the, in the male and half in the female and, and the, the delivery systems uh, to, to cause reproduction? How does that happen through uh, chance? It doesn't happen through chance. It cannot happen through chance. But that's what they want us to believe. Why? Because we're going to see they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. They do not want you to know that there is a God who loves you and created you. All right? <clears throat> and, that, and, of course, one of the main reasons is because uh, we have a sin nature that doesn't want to come to God. We kind of like our sin. We like it that way. And so we create an uh, imaginary world in which we can continue to be sinful, and it's okay. Right? I mean, we see it in the culture, right? The collapse and decay of culture. Where good is now evil, and evil is good. I mean, we, we're totally inverted from, you know, leave it to beaver days, right? That was just, what, the 50s, 60s? Here on 2023? Um, you know, so anyway. So, look at this. Um, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things that are seen are not made of things which do appear. Now, God created, Genesis 1.1, it says, the word of God tells us, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, how did he do it? He did it by speaking. <clears throat> God created the, everything through speaking. So, for example, in, in Genesis, in the first day, we see in verse 2, Genesis 1.2, you know, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So we can see light got lights on in here we can perceive it we see it it gives off heat and light so forth but the foundation of it is not something that's seen it's the word of god the word of god created light the word of god created all things so it's so the world is not made out of this massive explosion that all the matter in the universe was this is what they say okay look this is, i know it's hilarious but they say that all the matter of the entire cosmos was, was compressed down into the size of a period, like you'd see in written text. All of it was jam-packed in, and then boom, it exploded. <laughs> and then all these pieces came together and started forming, and, and then here came the Earth, this planet Earth, you know, and now it started a sun, and oh, isn't this an amazing, fascinating story? No, it's ridiculous. It's foolishness. It's laughable. <clears throat> It's obviously not true. It cannot be that way. So we know that God, when I'm looking through a telescope, I know exactly on what day of creation God spoke these things into existence when I look at the stars, when I look at the sun, when I look at the moon. I know the exact day and I know what they are. Okay? Not because of what I see through the telescope, but because of what I know from the scriptures. And I remember when, when I was at the, at the uh, taking pictures of the, the lunar eclipse back in May, so I went up to the mountain over there and I just had a beautiful view and everything. Zoomed in with my camera and taking pictures and stuff. And then when it was when it got into totality <coughs> and the moon was was <coughs> darkened, that's when it took on that blood red hue that I always heard about, but I'd never seen with my own eyes. And I looked through that camera and I saw this black, velvety dark background. And that blood moon 
appearance and the stars that previously I could not see because it was a full moon and the light you know, bleached out those stars. And it was breathtaking, the magnificence of that beauty I had never seen until that moment. And I quoted Psalm, I, I just said it out loud, I quoted Psalm uh, 19 verses 1 through 3. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, if you look up into the heavens and you look around, it's communicating a message if you'll receive it. It's communicating the eternal uh, power of God and his divinity. There ain't no way these heavens and that beautiful moon with those stars in the background, there is no way that stuff happened by chance, and there's no way your little idol that you rub and bow down and worship to, your little statue, did that. Because you created the idol, or some blacksmith chiseled it or whatever. Some man made the idol, and that idol did not make what I see in the heavens. There is a great and mighty and powerful God that exists, and all I've got to do is look up. That's why Pete, they don't want you to look up. They want you to look at these phones all day. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, we're in a stupor. <laughs> don't look up the king trail. We're going to block out the heavens so you can't look up there. Don't look up. Why? Because if you do, you're going to receive a message that contradicts the narrative. The narrative of, no, nah, it's a big bang. There is no God. Just trust your government. Right? Don't trust God. Trust your government. <laughs> Let's see how that works for you. So, so we see this, we understand this by faith. This is the reality, the substance. You know, there is no man that was alive, that was created when God spoke everything into existence. Man did not come into existence till day seven, or excuse me, day six. Day six and God rested on day seven. But the, creating, the creation had been done. It was just man, the crescendo, the crowning jewel of his creation was mankind. Oh yeah, that's another thing, they don't want you to know that either. They want life to be cheap and useless and worthless, disposable. Relationships are disposable. Life is disposable. You have no value. You're just a number in the machine. You're a cog in the machine. And when the cog breaks or no longer works, you just put another cog in there. So, so it's, well, that's why there's all this depression and sorrow and, and, and anxiety because man has been lied to. And, and we believe the lies, right? <clears throat> That we're nothing randomness, just a hairless ape that happened to crawl out of the, the goo. And I have no va intrinsic value when I depart this world. Who cares, right? Well, God cares. <clears throat> he demonstrated it in sending his son to die for us. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 23. I'll read this and we'll finish up on this point. Uh, which we read this earlier in the beginning. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, mankind suppresses this truth. They don't believe God. They don't trust God. They don't, they don't listen to the voice of creation and acknowledge and know that God created by speaking uh, things into existence. Men hold the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress it because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. You know there's no such thing as a real atheist. They're posers and pretenders because we know, everyone knows in their heart of hearts that there is a God. You know it. Now you may delude yourself into thinking that there isn't one and you may call yourself an atheist, but in your heart of hearts you have suppressed the reality of this truth because God has manifested it to you. It says it right here. It is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Oh, by the way, that's the other thing. The, the signs of the zodiac in the heavens tell the gospel message. Oh yeah, we don't want to know that either, right? Don't look up and don't, don't think and don't read. Just watch shows. Watch a show. Don't dare think and read. Just be entertained all your life. Because there's a message in the heavens that's screaming about our creator. And we're totally oblivious to it. Because we've successfully, they've successfully in, uh, seduced us with a lie. But this is clearly seen, these invisible things of God. Uh, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. 
uh, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. See, remember when I said our faith ultimately is uh, an agreement with the character of God or a denial of the character of God? So here it says, um, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. You see, there's a certain gratitude when you realize that God has created you and sustained you. There's a certain response of gratitude to that God, right? To, of giving of thanks to him. But, but we've suppressed that knowledge and therefore we do not glorify God. We do not ascribe glory to him and say, God, you are the creator of all these things, not the big bang, okay? Not the hairless apes that crawled out of the ooze that became us in the future, and think about the depths of this lie, man. There are museums around the world with these, you know, cavemen with a club in his hand, you know, like this. See, look, that proves it. Look there. And he moves robotically. See that? Oh, that's what happened. And our vain imagination fills in the gaps. There is no God. We just came out of the goo, man. We kill and eat each other and hopefully it is survival of the fittest, right? It's all a lie, a satanic lie. Okay, so you don't glorify God, you don't give thanks. They became vain in their imaginations. I mean, it is laughable, right? We, we came from monkeys. Hey, this, this is a joke, right? This is a joke. It's laughable. It's vain imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. These people that, you know, speak with a British accent, of course we evolved. It's quite obvious all scientific community agrees with this. Evolution, we go, oh. You're looking at a fool with a pipe. Yeah. I don't care how many degrees he has, he's a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You want to know what a fool is? He says there's no God. That's the first step. That's identify as a fool. You think there's no God. You are really stupid. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And so the text goes on from there in God's judgment upon mankind because of this intentional suppression of the truth. We don't want to know the truth, okay? Because then it frees us up to live how we want to live. It frees us up to, to justify the evil that we do and the evil that we love. And so we talked about it in Bible study. That's why men love darkness rather than the light. Because in darkness, like I say, in a nightclub, it's not called a day club. You don't go to a day club to, you know, to uh, carouse and do evil and do drugs and stuff. You wait till nighttime. You go out in the darkness and you're cloaked in darkness and no one can judge you, right? You can have, it's a speakeasy, right? You go to a speakeasy. This, in this environment, this is okay. And that's how man is. We, we want darkness to cloak our sin and so therefore we're not repro reproved for our evil. Uh, final verse, John 1, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that is made. Now we get even more detail. Now by faith of this verse, we understand, we know that the word is another name for Jesus Christ. We know that because in, in, down in verse uh, John 1, 14, we know that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that the word is Jesus Christ. Now we know something about this man named Jesus of Nazareth. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So now by faith, we can take this man, Jesus Christ, rewind the clock to the very beginning of, of the creation and know that he is the one who spoke everything into existence. It's his power. It's his word. And remember, I'll close on this point. <laughs> remember when the disciples were on the boat <clears throat> And Jesus is asleep and the storm comes up and they're like, the water's getting in the boat and they're afraid they're going to drown and die in the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is sleeping away. He's like not even concerned. And they rush to him and say, Master, care us out not that we perish? Wake up and help us. Grab a bucket and help bail out this boat, man. Jesus gets up like, oh, you have little faith. Peace be still. He speaks to the wind and the waves. Instantly, the wind stops and the waves turn to glass. The sea is turned as smooth as glass at his word. And remember what the disciples did? They fell down in terror. And they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? 
See, he gave them a little glimpse of his power that we see here. Without him, he made the wind. He made the waves. He's the author of the air and the environment. He commands and it stops. And that's what he did. He manifested his glory. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> that's just our first example. We'll move forward in Hebrews 11 and get into some really good, nitty-gritty, substantive uh, uh, examples of faith, the, the elders of Scripture, and how they had a testimony by faith. So our, our closing, I guess, our, our what's our takeaway here? We want to believe God, right? We want to believe God and not the lies of the world. Again, it is our faith. It is faith that God counts as righteousness, not your good deeds. So all the religions of the world with all their good works and their funny hats and their funny garments and their funny, you know, their chains and rings and all this stuff, it's all trappings on the outside. It does nothing for the sinful man that's on the inside. It just appears, it looks good on the outside. It's like a whitewashed tomb. It looks pretty on the outside, but inside it's full of dead men's bones and decay. That's how they are. That's what religion does. But God gives us, imputes righteousness to the sinful man when he does nothing more or less than by faith believe that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. In that epiphany moment of faith, you believe that truth? God counts that faith as righteousness and your sins are cast away as far as the east is from the west from you. How can God do that? Because Jesus died for your sins. He paid for it already. He paid. He was punished. The wrath of the Father was pulled out, poured out fully upon him instead of us. And that's grace. It's mercy of God. We just receive it by faith. So faith is important. <clears throat>